28, we're going to be read just a couple verses, beginning in verse 16, and we're going to talk about the directions of the Savior. Now, many of you know that I have spent most of my life, my other career, if you want to call it that, has been driving truck. And, um, you know, I don't brag about that too much anymore because people that are doing that job aren't really truck drivers, they're just steering wheel holders. But anyway, uh, I have been uh, to a lot of unique places and uh, in my life, and one of them is uh, New York City. So, uh, so uh, it's one thing to take your car to New York City, it's another thing to take a tractor trailer to New York City, is it not? Okay. And uh, so the, one, the very first time I went to New York City, which was a long time ago now, back in my uh, 20s, uh, I decided I need directions. Look at the title of the sermon today, The Directions of the Savior. The Lord knew not only were the disciples going to need directions, so would we. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But uh, let me finish this little story. So I'm in, I am making a delivery in a place called Hunts Point. Most of you have probably never been to Hunts Point because it's, it's, not the place. Nobody goes to Hunts Point on vacation, okay? So if you've been to Hunts Point, you know what I'm talking about. I could tell you stories that you would probably not believe, but they actually happen. So I'm going down the street. I have no idea where I'm supposed to be or where I'm going because um, street signs in Hunts Point, most of them have been stolen and so on and so forth. So I'm trying to figure out where I'm going, and I see a gas station on the other side of the street, and there's a guy sitting at the gas station. Uh, and he's, he's sitting on a chair out front of the gas station, kind of leaned back against it. It almost looked like something you'd find in South Carolina, you know what I mean? And so I thought, I bet he knows where this is. So I stop, I jump out of the truck, I run across the street to the guy, and as I'm walking up towards him, before I could say anything to him, he says, get in your truck! And I'm like, and he, I'm, I'm, why? Get in your truck! And I'm, so I went back over and got in the truck. I didn't know what was going on, and he goes walking over. He said, you're in Hunts Point. You don't ever get out of your truck. It won't be here when you come back. <laughs> so um, <laughs> he was serious. So, but he gave me directions to the place I was going, and it turned out I went there often for, for a while. And uh, so once I got the directions, I knew how to get there. Everything was good, but I needed the directions. I've also had people give me directions, and they finished with this statement. You can't miss it. I automatically assume I can, Okay. So, but anyway, Matthew has written over 18,000 words describing to us what he has seen, what his view has been of the life and ministry of Jesus. Over 18,300 18, and plus words that he has written to us. Uh, probably not the person, if you were choosing someone to be a writer for your book, I'm talking about God's word, you would probably, most of us would not have chosen. Matthew was a uh, tax collector. Tax collectors were hated in Bible days. They're not truly appreciated today, but uh, they were hated in Bible days, and there's reasons for that, and I've told you that in the past. I'm not going to go over all that this morning. But he at one point gave all that up and chose to follow Jesus. And when that happened, he became a very humble man, and he spent years following Christ uh, becoming a disciple and eventually laid down his life for Jesus. But he write down, wrote down 18,000 words, and we have walked through every one of them coming down to the finish line here today. We conclude our study to, uh, for Matthew with Jesus saying, get back in the truck. And I say that kind of tongue-in-cheek, but in all reality, when we get out of the vehicle, when we get out of our spiritual vehicles, when we get ourselves into big trouble... Satan comes along and snares us. And the next thing we know, we're backslidden. And so, as we study this this morning, I want you to think about what Jesus was saying here at the end. This, this is not a recap of the book of Matthew. This is just a simple instructions. And actually, it's very simple, and it's not that big. Uh, and we'll take care of that right here in just a minute. Today is Pentecost. Does anybody know what the word Pentecost means? Nobody? It means 50. Seriously, it means 50. It was 50 days. We, uh, Pentecost was on the 50th day after Jesus arose. And so today is Pentecost. And uh, it always falls on the seventh Sunday after Easter. And so uh, last week we 
talked about the resurrection, and then Lonnie this week sings about the foot of the cross, I couldn't help but think of today's Pentecost. And so it's the day the Spirit of God fell down on the disciples, these very guys he's giving directions to right now, Spirit of God anoints them in a powerful, special way. Their lives change. And if you want to know what their lives look like after, because we already know what they look like while Jesus was here. We have doubters, and we have people that have uh, uh, run away from him, and we have people that have uh, done all kinds of things, as, we, as we've learned in Matthew. Uh, take your Bible, return to Acts chapter 2, and begin reading, and you'll see what these same people, what happened to their lives. We're not going to do that this morning. I want to begin reading at verse 16. We're just going to read these few verses. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Amen. I am with you always. So the first thing I want to talk about this morning is who showed up at the meeting? The attendance to the meeting. That's what we're going to talk about first. It's found in verses 16 and 17. The first thing we see is the disciples showed up. Okay, it says here, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Now, this is 40 miles from Jerusalem. They traveled 40 miles to Galilee, to the mountain that Jesus had told them that's where he was going to uh, meet them. Some believe it's the Mount of uh, Transfiguration. We don't know that for sure because the Bible uh, doesn't say that, okay? But uh, we know there's 11 disciples, and because one of them is Judas, and he has betrayed Christ, he has now committed suicide. He's out of the picture all, altogether. Now, John, or excuse me, Matthew does not give us the picture of the meeting with the ten disciples earlier when Jesus met with ten of them, and then Thomas shows up and said, I don't really believe he was here. I won't believe unless I touch him. Remember that story? Tom, uh, Matthew, excuse me, does not tell us that version. Um, eight days after that, Jesus showed up again, and Matthew, or uh, Thomas was there. I'm getting all the names mixed up. Thomas was there. And he actually, the Lord said, go ahead and touch me. And Thomas said, uh, oh, no, Lord, my, you're, you're my God. And Thomas uh, uh, stood there in awe of what he saw in Jesus. But uh, Matthew doesn't record that story either of the 11 showing up. But he does record this. And this happens sometime later. And it's in Galilee where the Lord promised to meet him. Meet them. Matthew 26, we read this a few weeks ago, verse 32. After I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Okay, over in Matthew 28, we read this uh, uh, last week when Jesus meets the women that had come to the tomb and he bumps into them on the road away from the tomb and he said, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my disciples and tell them I'm going to Galilee. Okay, so there's nothing really amazing about the fact that they went to Galilee because that's where Jesus said he was going to go. But this is not like going to Nescapec or going to Berwick. This is 40 miles on foot to go and meet with the Savior. <clears throat> okay, and so we see the disciples attend. Look at verse 17. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Okay, most Bible scholars, even though the scripture doesn't say this, most Bible scholars believe this is uh, uh, talking here about not just the 11, but others that were in attendance. And so we're going to call that others attended. Now, where that comes from is over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where uh, Paul wrote, writes there, Jesus appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. That's where this comes from, this idea that there were others there. And it's interesting <clears throat> that the word doubt there wasn't doubting the resurrection. They had seen Jesus, they know he's alive, but they may have been a little bit confused on like why his entrance here at Galilee was different than his entrance before, because every place that Jesus shows up after his resurrection, he walks through the wall, he just poofies there, okay, uh, because he has the transformed body. We talked about that a little bit last week, and so uh, they're like, that's, you know, that's, that's a little different, but some doubted, it says. So he, he meets here uh, 
with, with the disciples. We already see that. And it's interesting because in Luke chapter 24, the Bible tells us that Jesus meets with the disciples again uh, before he has ascended up into heaven. And where does he meet with them? In Jerusalem. And so there is the idea here that uh, this wasn't for the 11 apostles or disciples because they could have met Jesus in Jerusalem because they're going to meet there later anyhow. They traveled 40 miles each way uh, to have this meeting. So there was other, others involved. This is a public uh, gathering. And as, as Paul wrote, 500 uh, people, more than 500 brothers at one time uh, saw Jesus. And so then one more group of people shows up here that attended, and that's us. We attended. You say, what do you mean? Well, the Bible tells us that it is written for our understanding and our knowledge and for our training. And so when we read down through the rest of this text, we're going to see that it is written for us as well. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 11, verse 28, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And so we're there because we're going to hear the word of God, and now we're expected to keep it. The Bible is for learning. And when it speaks, we should listen. When it speaks, we should listen. Thank you. And so here Jesus speaks in Galilee, but he also speaks in Nescopec in 2022. Because the Bible is the living word of God. Now, we have, a, uh, we have a politician at this time who feels that <clears throat> the Constitution can be changed. It's not in concrete, is his words, okay? And I, whatever he feels about the Constitution is up to him, but I got news for you. When it comes to the Word of God, it is in concrete, and it's alive and active in our lives every day. It never works for you if you never spend time in it. Don't expect God to do great things in your life. Don't expect God to answer prayer. Don't expect God to show you what he wants you to do if you never spend any time reading his word. It's all here. Praise God. Okay, so we have the attendance at the meeting, and now we're going to talk about the message of the meeting. The message. What happens? What's the message? And it's verses 18, 19, and 20. The first thing we notice in verse 18, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So the first thing we see is the authority. The message is, I'm the one that has the authority. Authority here means absolute power. It means the right to rule. It means an official privilege. And so Jesus says to them, I've been given all authority, meaning that there is none above him. He's got, he's got all authority now. And he says, uh, that he is he's given it on earth. Uh, it's been given to him. So uh, the whole book of Matthew, if you think back over 84 sermons, we realize that continually there's talking about authority, the authority of Jesus. And so it's not surprising that Matthew finishes up the book with another statement of authority, but this one made by Jesus himself saying all authority uh, was given to him. In Matthew chapter 7, we learn that there was a, the authority of his teaching. In Matthew chapter 8, we learned that he had the authority to heal. In Matthew chapter 9, we learned that he had the power and the authority to forgive sins. Every one of us should amen that. Uh, chapter 10, I like this one. He has the authority over Satan. Amen. So all these places in Scripture and many more in Matthew shows us that he has authority. So he makes it very clear here, makes it very pointed, leaves out any doubt and says, I have been given, Jesus speaking, I have been given all authority. Look at the wording. Starts with the letter A, all authority. And so the Lord now has all authority. And we know uh, that that covers everything. So <clears throat> the second thing we see in the message of the meeting is the activity. The activity of the meeting. It says, go therefore. This is what I'm getting. I have authority now. I'm going to give you the authority and a command or the instructions or the directions, whatever you want to call them. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So <clears throat> Jesus talked to those who were sitting there. We know there's at least the 11 apostles and probably many more. But he also spoke to all of us that are sitting here today. The, the command that God gave uh, there 
is not any different to those than it is to us as well today. And so we find some interesting words. The first one is the word go. Okay, go. Now, <clears throat> it's interesting because for years I thought, and I've heard preachers say, that the word go is God's command to go do something. And then after doing some studying, I find out that's not, that's not a command. The word go here in the original language is not a command. Listen carefully. It's not a command. You say, well, then I don't have to do it. Oh, wait a minute. It's not a command, but you know what it really means? I'm already going. That's what it really means. It really means I'm already going. It's a progressive word uh, that is saying uh, I, I'm in motion. I'm already headed somewhere. I'm going. And so the wording could very well be as you go. Well, how do we get that? Because when we come to saving knowledge of Christ and we accept Jesus as our Savior, we are now on a journey. The journey ends up where? In heaven. We're on a journey. Okay. But in the process, we're still living life here. Unless you get saved and one second later fall over dead, boom, which that will be glory for me. Amen. Wouldn't that be great? But that's not how it happens. We still have to live life here. And when we live life here, we're on a journey. Every day we get up and we put one foot in front of another and we continue this journey. And the Lord says here to the disciples who have already been on a journey for three plus years with him. He talks to anyone else that was there, and he talks to us in Nescapec this morning and anywhere around the world where you're listening by live stream. He says, while you're on the journey, while you're in the process, while you're moving, while you're going forward, he says, make disciples of all nations. So is the, does the Lord discriminate? The answer is no, because the word is all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So there is an interesting word in the sentence that is a command, and the word command is the word disciples. That is the command. The Lord, does, the Lord says, in your process of taking the journey, I command you to make disciples. The word here, to command, is to, or the word here to, to, uh, to be disciples is the same meaning as you would if you were in a job that you were an apprentice, okay? And so, what you know, we don't have enough of that in our world today to be very truthful. I think a lot of jobs should have apprentices before you get the, the real job. But anyway, we are to go out and make disciples and apprentices for Jesus. What's an apprentice? Apprentice is a person who works, walks, spends time with the person who has the knowledge so that some of it rubs off on them. Now, if I'm going to go somewhere, and you're a decent driver, okay, I'd rather follow you than you tell me how to get there. I notice I did say decent driver, right? Uh, I don't want you to think we're in a road race and you're trying to get away from me. That's not the plan, okay? But as Christians, we, when we come to Jesus, we should find people in our lives. It could be our children. It could be our grandchildren. It could be our neighbor. It could be anybody else in our life that we can take under our wings, so to speak, and disciple them and to bring them along so uh, to make an apprentice of them. So as they journey in life, they look at us. You know, Paul, Paul didn't cut any slack. Paul said, uh, what you see me do, you should do. Okay, you say, well, that's scary. I don't want to tell somebody that. But if we're living the life we're supposed to be living, as we learned on Wednesday night, holy life, then we should have no danger, no concern, no, no worry about saying to somebody, walk this way. Amen? Because our life should be that, that we could do that. And so we see the command to go. I mean, the, the command to disciple, not the command to go. The command to disciple or to make apprentices. So we are to help people to, to know who Jesus is, to believe in him, to grow in a relationship with him, and to obey him. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy, by the way, Timothy was one of Paul's apprentices who later on became a pastor. And, and Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses instruct to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And so if we do our job right of discipleship and we do our job right as uh, apprentices, they should then be able to turn around and go and do the same thing to someone else. 
I want you to know this morning that the reason the body of Christ is in such deplorable shape in our world is because that does not happen. That does not happen. Over the years, I've had, I don't know how many guys, ask me, would you disciple me? Would you? And i got to be honest with you. Uh, you know, I, I'm willing, but so often they fall by the wayside. I've had women come to me and say, Pastor, do you have a lady in church who would disciple me? And I line them up with someone, and a couple weeks later, they're, they're by the wayside. Because being an apprentice means that you have to do the crud of the job. You're going to get down into muck and dirty because... The person that's teaching you and training you, that's what they had to learn, how to get down in the, in the dirty and, and, and learn the hard way. You know, when I was a kid, my dad was probably, uh, you know, I was an apprentice to my dad because growing up, we, things, isn't the world much different today? Okay. So, you know, we didn't have TV until I was 13 years old. So, uh, <clears throat> which, I, you know, I look back on that, I'm wishing it was 16 or 18 or 30 or 50 or something, you know. Uh, it, it did not hurt us that we did not have TV. But we wanted to be around Dad a lot. My kids, when they were growing up, if I was going someplace, they wanted to go a lot. Okay. And, you know, I, I was thinking back the other day. Uh, I worked for a towing company for a while, and I had to go pick up a truck. It broke down over by Williamsport. And I, the boss called me, can you go? I said, my wife is working, and I'm here by myself, and I have my kids. He said, take them with you. And so I didn't ask them if they wanted to go because I already knew the answer. And they were small. They weren't real big. I, don't, uh, I can't tell you exactly how old they were. But, well, I can, uh, right off the top of my head here, I can tell you that Michael was probably about five. Okay? And so I take them with me. And we're in the, middle, in the front of a, a tow truck. And we're riding along. And one of them's sitting on a milk crate in the middle because there wasn't enough room. And the other two are strapped in this one-person seat on the other side. All illegal today. I understand that. But... Um, uh, and, my, and you know how many people died from all this? Nobody. Anyway, so we go over to Williamsport, and we get there. And uh, I remember uh, the vehicle that I had to pick up had to be picked up from the back end because the, the, the rear end of the truck was out. I had to pick up from the back. I had a tailgate, lift gate, which is really difficult. Now, nowadays, they have all this fancy stuff. If you watch uh, Ron uh, uh, Pratt on, on YouTube, I love Ron Pratt. He's a born-again Christian. He owns a towing well, organization out in the Midwest. I like watching him. Uh, but anyway, if you, I'm like, wow, we never had that. We had to get dirty. And so I got to the point where, you know, when you pick up the truck with a lift gate on it, you can very easily destroy the lift gate. So you got to be very careful. And so I'm at the point where I need three hands, and I need to be like eight feet in two different places. So I went up to the truck, and I got Billy out of the truck. Okay? My kids behaved. If I told them to sit still, guess what they did? They sat still. I'm serious. Okay? So I went and got Billy out of the truck. He was uh, four years old. So he's about nine years old. And I get him out of the truck. Uh, just trying to think of a nine-year-old. Anyway, um, so I get him out of the truck. I bring him back. We're on, a, we're on Route 180 in Mentorsville, right next to where Walmart is. And we're standing alongside the interstate. People are flying by. And I said to him, I need you to do what I tell you to when I tell you to do it. Okay, Dad. And I showed him what I needed him to do. And I got some blocks of wood, and I got ready to put them in under the truck so the lift gate uh, would not get destroyed. And while I'm doing this, I'm thinking if he screws up, I could lose my arm, I could lose my head, I could lose my life uh, because of what we were doing. And i never forget, I said, now, he did it, and it worked, and we're here to tell you about it today. Okay, the, the point being was I showed him ahead of time, this is what I need you to do. I, have, I, I discipled him about pushing the lever at the right time. He was my apprentice. We need to be doing that spiritually. Look at people in your life. They could be a relative. It could be a neighbor. It could be somebody you work with that is a brand new Christian or a young Christian. And what I mean by young is they're, they're not deep in Christ. You need to be discipling them. You need to bring alongside of them yourself and, and help them because we need them to go out and teach other people, as Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy. And in the writing here, Christ says, go out and disciple all nations. Then he says, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, true disciples want to follow the leader. And Jesus was already the leader. Every year when we do baptism, 
You know, I always tell people, baptism is an act of obedience, and the Lord was the one that showed us it was important. Do you remember John standing in the creek? And Jesus comes walking down, and John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of man. And Jesus says, I come to get baptized. John said, No, 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 no. You baptize me. And Jesus said, No. And John baptized Jesus. Can you imagine? What, what a day that was, huh? I love when we do baptism. Everybody get excited around the swimming pool. I can't even imagine when some dog got baptized. And so the true disciples, disciples would follow Jesus because he's the example. And then <clears throat> in verse 20, it says, teaching them, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. Teaching them what I've already taught you, Jesus said. I want you to teach them what I've taught you. And so when we mentor people, we are training them in the word of God. We're training them in the truth of the scripture. We are training them to be obedient to what God says. Warren Wiersbe said, it is not enough to win people to the Savior. We must also teach them from the word of God. And I say amen. Which, by the way, I think most of you know this. The reason, I always tell you, the reason that we use the word of God here at Cornerstones because it's the only thing I know to do. And if you take away my Bible, I'm done. Amen? But there's another reason. It's because what the Lord has commanded us to do is teach the word. You don't need my opinion. You don't need stories. You don't need stupid stuff. You just need the word, the word of God. And so we see here the authority and the activity, and then the Lord says, I'll tell you where you're going to get your ability. Look at verse 20. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I would encourage you to underline that in your text. I love it. It does not say here, I will be with you. It doesn't say here, I should be with you. It doesn't say down the road someplace I'm going to be with you. It says, I am. I am with you. When? Now. Always to the end of the age. If you have Jesus as your Savior today, he's with you, and I, you cannot get rid of him. Praise God. To the end of the age, forever. He's always been, he always will be. And the first thing he does here in this little piece of sentence, he says, I am. It's a promise from God. This is who I am, he says. This is who I am. You know, sometimes people make a promise, I'll meet you so-and-so at such and such, and they don't show up or they're late. Or people, I'll bring that next week, and then they don't bring it because they forgot. And, you know, there's something about getting old, amen? You forget a lot more, right? Okay. Uh, but, you know, we're, we are, at our very best, we, we're only partially effective with our promises. But when the Lord says, I am, guess what that means? I am. This is who I am. Jesus says, you look me up in the dictionary, and it's going to say, I am the God who is with you always. I'm with you always. In chapter 18, uh, he said, <clears throat> uh, in, the, in, the, in the midst of everything there, he says, I'll be in the midst of you. But here in chapter 28, uh, he says, I am with you. I am with me. Before he was talking about a group, and now he's saying it's a personal thing. I'm with you. And you say, how in the world can God be with me and be with those other people over there and the people across the Atlantic and where? Because he's God. And he has the ability and he gives us the ability uh, to serve him and to, to fulfill what he has called us to do right here. Him sending his spirit. And, of course, we talked about that with the uh, renting of the veil from the top to the bottom. Sending his spirit to be with us has made that Something that can be accomplished. If Jesus remained on the earth, do you realize he could only be with whoever was near him? But because he went back to the throne room of heaven, hallelujah, he has the ability to be with all of us all the time. Amen? Amen. Romans 8 9 says, Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So when we come to Jesus in our salvation, we surrender our life to him, we belong to him. He's concerned about us. He's watching out for us. We're concerned about our children and our grandchildren. We're concerned about the people next door, maybe, or whoever it is. And yet, think about it. Almighty God is concerned about me. And he never leaves me nor forsakes me. He is with me 
always. And do you notice at the end of verse 20, there isn't a verse 21, there isn't a 20C or anything else where it says, if you something. Do you notice that? The Lord says here, I am with you always to the end of the age. And boom, that's it. Not if you listen to me, not if you behave me, not if you never do this, not if you do that. There's no, there's nothing added there. There's no conditions for us to keep. He says, I am with you always, always. And you look back in scripture and we see places where God was intervening in people's lives. Look at, look at uh, Jonah. He was under the water. God was intervening in his life. Uh, we, we look at uh, Elijah there on Mount uh, Carmel, and we have all these guys. That's an interesting story there uh, on its own self. I love it because we often ref we think of Elijah's faith, but you know what? All of the prophets of Baal had faith. They just had faith in the wrong person. You know, all these different people, the Lord's with them always. There's, think about Elijah for a second. I started to say it, and I got sidetracked about the faith. But if Elijah is wrong, he dies. But he trusted the Lord. The Lord was with him on Mount Carmel. You know what? All through the New Testament, we find scripture after scripture, the Lord uh, being with people. And then we come into our day and age now, and you can talk to missionaries who will testify of the awesomeness of God in their lives in certain situations where it could only be God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's finish up today with a couple lessons for us from here, from this text. I want to focus back on verse number 17. Just a one little part where it says, some doubted. Some doubted. The first thing I want you to notice is doubting steals the joy of discipleship. Doubting steals the joy of dis discipleship. See, doubt is a lack of faith. If you do not believe that Christ is who he said he is, and you do not believe Christ is going to do what he says he's going to do, and you do not believe he is with you always, and you have doubt, you lack faith. And when you have faith, when you lack faith, it gives Satan room to work. Now, I know some of us don't want to talk about him, but the Bible talks about him, so we need to talk about him at times as well. But Satan's, one of his big tricks that he does to you and I every day, and some of you will sit here and say, I'm guilty of that, and I know what he's talking about, is he likes to make us doubt. He likes to make us <clears throat> worry all the time so that we are distracted from Jesus, and we're distracted from the Word of God, and we are distracted from ministry. And so we don't find discipleship as a joy of trying to lead someone along and direct their paths, we find discipleship as a, a, a yoke, a burden, because we're battling Satan all the time and at the same time trying to mentor someone. Doubting steals the joy of discipleship. I think if you were to talk to those people that listed there in verse 17 that it says some doubted, I think if you were to talk to them, you might find out uh, that, uh, you know, <clears throat> They, they would be honest and say, you know, this whole doubting process has really affected uh, my ability to serve the Lord. Because it does. The next one, number two, doubt questions the authority of God. When you're doubting, you're questioning the authority of God. Jesus said in verse 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. When you doubt, you're saying, I don't know if you're strong enough, God. When you doubt, I don't know, Lord, if you're capable. Lord, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Doubt questions the authority of God. When we question God, the authority of God, we start questioning what he's doing. Why is that happening? Why is that happening now? Uh, I don't know how I fit into that picture, Lord. Uh, and so it steals our trust in God. Doubt questions the authority of God. Yeah, and I know there's only a couple words in verse 17. Some doubted. You say, well, I didn't think about those two words being so powerful. They are because we fall into the same rut, do we not? Doubt questions the authority of God. Number three, doubt limits the word of God. 
He says in verse 20, we are to teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. But when we doubt, we doubt the word of God. We doubt what it says. We doubt what he's, what he's trying to tell us. And we even sometimes doubt the authority of the word of God. And so we start having all kinds of questions. And in doing that, uh, we question the word of God, its power, its effectiveness. We question um, <clears throat> what is he allowing us to go through uh, because we just don't see that we should be doing that. Uh, we question the truth of the word of God. I'm just not sure if the Bible is 100% truth. I got news for you this morning. I believe the Bible is accurate and truthful from the beginning to the end. And I'm going to keep believing it because it is getting fulfilled. I had a, the joy this week of something. Um, I was talking to somebody uh, about the world situation, and they were discussing about, oh, this you know, looks like the end times and whatever. Uh, and I think their idea of end times and my idea of end times is probably something different. But anyway, I said, you know, I said, uh, I believe in a biblical worldview. I look at everything through the word of God. And so now when I look at what's happening around our world, Jesus is coming soon. It's not because I'm so smart, because I'm not. It's the truth of the word of God. Doubt limits the word of God. Number four, doubt takes our trust off of God. Doubt takes our trust. Look at verse 20. I am with you always. When we doubt, we start not believing that God is with us always. We start questioning where God is and what God's doing. When we doubt, we, we not only not trust God, we don't trust anyone. We're just doing it on our own. Everything that's going on in our life is questioned. Not questioned according to the word of God. You're not lining your questions up uh, against the word of God. You're lining them up between people's opinions and, and so on and so forth. Do you ever uh, stop to think that people are sometimes wrong? But the word of God? Never wrong. Never. If I have a choice to listen to what you say or listen to what the word of God says, I love you, I'm not taking your opinion. I'm going to take the word of God. Philippians 4.13, all of you know the scripture. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's where you are. That is what you can say. That is what you can believe when you're not filled with doubt. When you're filled with doubt, you say things like, I can do most things. Not all things. John, the apostle. When we were just studying on Wednesday nights about the different I am's of the book of John, we came across this verse in verse 15, or chapter 15, verse 5. He said, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, I in him. He it is that bears much fruit. And then he finishes that verse with this, Jesus saying it, for apart from me, you can do Nothing. Nothing. If you're one of those people that would have been sitting in a crowd and been listed as some doubting, and this morning doubt is a big problem in your life and worry and fear and so on and so forth, I want you to know that Jesus' promise in verse 20, I am with you always, is still available to us and is accurate for us every day of our life. You might say, I don't understand why I'm going through what I'm going through. And you may never understand. I don't understand why people hurt me. And I don't understand why this. I you may never know the answers to that. But this I can give you a truth for. And the answer to, he has never left you nor forsook you. There's times when you feel alone. Oh, I know that. I understand that. I've been there. But Jesus didn't leave you alone. People may have left you alone. You may have chosen to be alone. Being alone is okay sometimes, amen? Every mother said amen, right? But I tell you what, Jesus has never left you alone. Because he says, I am with you. How much? Always. Let's pray. Lord, we come to a conclusion of the, of the book of Matthew. And I just wonder how much we missed. 
so powerful, so clear to all of us. And Lord, I want to really help us this morning. I, I pray your spirit has taught us and focused us on, first of all, we should not doubt. And second of all, we are never alone. We are never alone. Tomorrow may bring struggles and strife in our homes and our families and our jobs. Tomorrow may bring disaster in our world. Even today, as we saw last week and in the past few weeks, where churches have had shootings and so on and so forth happen. And it may happen here. But Lord, we're not alone. We're not alone. Somebody this week may not be here next week because they've been taken out of the world by you. But they're not alone. We may get some bad news this week. We're not alone. Thank you, Lord, that as followers of Christ, we are never alone. Lord, may that stick in our heads. May it be a truth that we stand to and we do uh, stand for and we do not doubt. That we're never alone when we have you as our Savior. Lord, for someone here this morning that doesn't know you, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Lord, melt the hardness of the heart. Kick the evil one out of their lives so they can see the truth because we know your word says the truth will set us free. Lord, if we know you today and we're just struggling with being a discipler, with walking our walk with you, with being baptized even maybe, Lord, please, Jesus, take away the doubt, the struggle, and remind us that you're with us and you will always be with us. In your precious name we pray. Amen.